Uh, bienvenidos todos al seminario Diálogos de Matemáticas y Culturas. Eh, el día de hoy tenemos a Tony Phillips de la Universidad de Stony Brook. Eh, él ya tiene varios años dedicado a la, al trabajo de divulgación de cosas de matemáticas y arte. Eh, también escribe la columna de la American Mathematical Society en Math in the Media. Uh, hizo su doctorado en Princeton, después estuvo tres años en Berkeley, and desde ahí se fue a Stony Brook y ha estado ahí durante todo este tiempo. Welcome Tony. Thank you for Thank you. giving the talk. Uh, do I start? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, uh, thanks, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, it's really uh, a subject that's dear to my heart and that I, uh, I really enjoy talking about. So, uh, this is about topological surfaces in Bach's puzzle canon. So, we'll explain a little bit what this means as we go along. But uh, let's see if this is working. Come on. Whoop. Yeah, first of all, this talk is based on some work I did with a, uh, my friend Eric Altschuler. And there was an article about 10 years ago in Musical Times. But there's more actually uh, here than is uh, than was in the article. Uh, so we start out by looking at a, a musical score. Uh, is basically a, a two-dimensional thing. I mean, obviously it's it's on the page. Uh, this this uh, particular. I don't know if you recognize this. This is a uh, this is from a very old uh, missile made to use during uh, Catholic ceremonies. This is part of the Kyrie eleison. This dates back to the 14th, 15th century. So it shows you uh, how old this tradition is. If you are used to reading music, you can see that the uh, the representation of uh, with lines and notes is very, very similar to what we have today. Right, there are some differences, but they have uh, clefts and they have accidentals. And uh, <clears throat> it's uh, this tradition must have started, um, I would guess, a couple of hundred years before this uh, um, manuscript was prepared, but uh, it, it was already very, um, very solidly uh, established then. So uh, in a musical score, there are basically two dimensions. Uh, there's uh, pitch, uh, which is higher notes are up on the page and lower notes are down on the page. This is a, an old convention that we all take for granted. And then time uh, runs from left to right on the page as you read. So, uh, Topologically speaking, uh, if you have a, a one voice musical score, it's a uh, two dimensional strip. Uh, you have the higher pitches up, lower pitches down, and you go from the start to the end. So what happens when we have symmetry in the score? Well, the, the simplest symmetry is just uh, translational uh, translational symmetry, if you have a, a score which repeats, this is what we call a vamp. They play it uh, while they're waiting for something to happen, right? And uh, uh, <clears throat> you can see in the musical notation, there are these marks, uh, they call repeat marks on either side of the uh, portion that is supposed to be repeated. Right, there's the, the solid, the very thick vertical bar with uh, the two dots. So e everything that's between those two uh, repeat signs gets, gets repeated usually just once, but if it says repeat ad lib, you can just keep repeating it over and over again as in, in this vamp. So once you have this translational symmetry, it means that the score is topologically a cylinder because uh, after the after the end, you just uh, link right back to the start and you you play it again. Now, how about canons? 
Well, a uh, the simplest kind of canon is in just two parts. And in the simplest of those, you have a second voice which imitates the first voice after a delay, imitates it exactly. And the best one known is this one, uh, Frere Jacques. So here's the... The, uh, if you notice the, uh, <clears throat> the end of the second statement of the, uh, of the theme harmonizes with the beginning of the first one. So the, in this blue box, you see the, on the top line, you have the beginning of the second statement and on the, that's the beginning of the first statement and the bottom line, you have the end of the second statement and uh, they, they, they also harmonize. So it means that the, um, the thing can just repeat over and over again. Uh, and I call what's between those two lines, we'll call this the, the steady state of the, of, the, uh, of the canon. So you start out with these introductory measures, and then uh, after the introductory measures, you're in this, uh, in, back in this kind of cylindrical mode, where you can just continue on and on as uh, as as long as you feel like it. Uh, canons were a uh, a specialty of uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, so he's a, uh, a a very well known composer, of course, uh, active in really the beginning of the 18th century. So during the uh, end of Louis XIV, beginning of Louis XV. That that period in 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 history, and uh, canons were really his, in some sense, uh, his hobby. I would say, uh, and in this portrait, this is the best known portrait of Bach. Actually, he's holding a musical score, and it's the score of a canon. Uh, this canon turns out to be one of a set of fourteen that he composed. Uh, on the baseline of the Goldberg variations. So uh, this is the manuscript is called, uh, uh, it has kind of an interesting history itself. It was uh, only discovered in 1974 in the, uh, in the Bibliothèque Nationale in, in Paris. Uh, it was in the back of Bach's own copy, own printed copy of the Goldberg variations. So in the back, he'd, he'd, uh, he'd written these canons. Uh, and before I go on to the next slide, the, uh, in the blue box, you see this canon 13. That's the one he's holding in the, uh, in the painting. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> here's the page with, the, with box title. This is in his handwriting. Uh, various canons based on the first eight baseline notes of the foregoing aria. Foregoing aria, this is the end of the Goldberg variations. It was the aria in the Goldberg variations. And un until 1974, only uh, that canon, the one in the painting, and then one other one that he'd written in someone's uh, <clears throat> autograph book uh, were the only ones that were known. So these were, this was a big Bach discovery uh, back in uh, 1974. So here's the here's the aria. Actually, if you're familiar with the Goldberg variations, you can you can imagine uh, uh, what it sounds like. But uh, I've uh, highlighted in in red the first eight notes of the bass line. Uh, it, they sound like this. Right, and uh, you can see them up on the score of the of the aria. Actually, it's uh, they would be played much slower if I were going along with the tempo of the aria. But anyway, there they are. And uh, if you look at the bottom, uh, there's a 
and large picture of the first canon of the set of 14. And they're those same uh, eight notes, uh, exactly the same actually in, uh, in red. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna be looking at uh, two of these canons in particular, uh, canon three and canon five. And uh, these are part of a set uh, labeled uh, motu recto et contrario, uh, meaning that they, they use both upright and upside down motion of the voices in, uh, in pitch. So let's look at, this is a, a, a blow up of, of Canon three. And uh, you can see why these are called puzzle canons because when Bach wrote them, uh, <clears throat> this is all, this little piece of uh, score is all there is. So there's puzzle clues as to how it's supposed to be performed. So if you look at the beginning, there's a, uh, a bass clef and an upside down alto clef, right? Which means that the score is to be read uh, once as written and then once upside down with the uh, <clears throat> with the the bass the coordinate given by that alto clef, which is uh, upside down. Also, you'll see a little mark that looks like a a percent sign. Uh, this is called a senyo. And it tells you where the second voice uh, comes in in the canon. So uh, again, we have the our our principal voice, and we also have this the the second voice played with the alto clef. Right. So those are the the two ingredients. In, and uh, here's how Bach puts them together. So again, uh, <clears throat> you get the, uh, the introductory measures and the steady state that's uh, cycling uh, around and around. Okay, we we could look into the uh, the topology of this uh, canon, but uh, the same topology occurs with with more notes, so it's easier to see in uh, in canon five. So canon five has four voices, and the bottom two voices uh, with the you can see with the blue brackets here uh, are the canon we just heard, canon three, and then superimposed on that are two other voices. The two other voices are also, one is the upside down of the other. As you can see, the first one starts with uh, GFG and uh, the second one starts with like a DED up, uh, up on top, upside down. So this is what, the, this is what that canon sounds like. So uh, uh, if you listen carefully, you can hear the Canon three playing in the in the lower register, where these other two voices are are uh, are harmonizing in the in the upper two uh, upper two staves here. So let's look at the uh, top two voices in the steady state. So I've just isolated this part of the uh, of the score, and uh, if I take its mirror image, right, this is just a uh, optical mirror image. Uh, you can see that the the last two measures are uh, exactly the upside down of the first two measures. 
right? And similarly, of course, the uh, <clears throat> it works the other way around. So this is a special case of what we call uh, glide reflection symmetry. You translate and you flip. So if we have a, in general, a periodic text in which the second half is the glide reflection of the first, uh, it naturally uh, lives in a in a Möbius strip. Uh, the periodicity means it's uh, it's really on a cylinder, and then because of the uh, the glide reflection, you can roll this cylinder up on itself uh, with a twist uh, to form a Möbius strip. So here, for example, you would start with. Uh, P, Q, R, F, and then upside down P, upside down Q, etc. Here you can imagine something P, Q. Now uh, my the the cursor is going along the bottom of the letter, so P, Q, R, F, and when I get around to here, I have upside down P, upside down Q, upside down R, upside down F, and then P, Q, R, F. Right, so this the uh, the this text lives naturally on a Möbius strip. Here's another picture of that same uh, Möbius strip, uh, just uh, flipped over. And here's a very important point: the text is in the strip, not on the surface of the strip. So you can read the text from both sides. Right, I'm sort of taking that for granted in my explanation that you can sort of see through it. It's not printed on one surface of the strip. It's actually inside the strip. This turns out to be a very important uh, distinction. So let's take the score of the steady state of the first two voices of Canon 5. Uh, and I'm just looking at the, the upper two voices without the clefs and the time markings. Uh, then I can, I can roll it into a Möbius strip so that the notes match exactly. Because remember, this is this satisfies the criterion uh, I just mentioned that uh, the the second half is the mirror image of the first half. And you can actually do this. You can print it on a, a transparent piece of uh, of material like a uh, an overhead projector slide from the the bygone days of overhead projectors, right? And then you can roll it up on itself uh, uh, with a twist, and uh, it forms uh, a Möbius strip. And you can see the, the, the two instances of each note come together exactly, right? Uh, the only difference is the, the tails are on the opposite side, right? But the notes are exactly in the same place. And this is what it sounds like. So this is what this this is the sound of a of a Möbius strip, yeah. Um, let's see. I meant to put this in the in the slide, but uh, if you want to make this uh, this gizmo here, uh, I put the template on my web page. So if you go to my web page, uh, uh, math.stonybrook.edu. Uh, and then you just go to Tony, and at the bottom of my webpage, you'll see a uh, a link to uh, an image you can print, and then uh, cut it out and uh, assemble it into. Uh, you can have your very own uh, canonical uh, Möbius strip. Yeah, it's kind of fun. So here's here's a a different example. Uh, this is a canon from the musical offering. Uh, the musical offering uh, <clears throat> is a uh, <clears throat> a compendium of uh, of works that Bach wrote after visiting the uh, King Frederick in Potsdam in uh, uh, 1747. <clears throat> So there's a whole story there. He was invited to the court 
because his son, uh, I think Carl Philip Emanuel, was a musician in the uh, working for the king. And uh, he came to the court and uh, the king wanted him to try out his pianos. So this was at the, at the moment of the invention of the piano to replace the, the harpsichord. The king had a collection of pianos made by Silberman, a very famous uh, instrumentalist of the time. And he wanted Bach to, to try them out. And then he, uh, he sort of challenged Bach uh, to, to uh, improvise a, uh, a fugue on a theme that uh, he proposed. So the king sat down at the piano. The king was a musician, actually. He was a, a flutist. Uh, he sat down at the piano and, and, uh, and uh, 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 played this, uh, this melody. Kind of an interesting, uh, unusual uh, theme, uh, but uh, he said, "Okay, Bach, uh, improvise." And uh, according to the newspaper reports at the time, he sat down and he improvised a three-part fugue or ricercare, also called, uh, on this theme, to the amazement of the uh, the king and the. Uh, the uh, the witnessing nobility that were standing around watching this. So uh, the uh, the musical offering has uh, a whole bunch of stuff in it. It has a along with uh, yeah. Let me backtrack a moment. So uh, then the king said, "Okay, that's three. Can you do six? And Bach said, "Apparently." Uh, uh, six, uh, I can't do, but I'll go home. I'll do it and I'll have it, uh, I'll print it up and send it to you. And uh, after he went home, along with the, the three and the six, he composed a whole bunch of other things, a trio sonata and, uh, and a whole slew of canons and had them all uh, printed up with the title page that you just saw. Uh, let me go see if I can go back to it. Uh, right. Most humbly dedicated by Johann Sebastian Bach. Now, uh, all the all the elements of the musical offering, the 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 Ricercares, the trio sonata, and the uh, and the canons are based on the theme, the so-called royal theme that the, the king had sat down at the piano that day and, and proposed to Bach. It says here 1741, but that's wrong. It's 1747. Now, for Canon 5 is uh, special, uh, Bach uses a slightly different version of this theme. You'll you'll notice that the the theme itself starts and ends on the same note. Uh, I don't know if we can can I play it here? No, sorry. Uh, well, we just heard it. Let me play it once more, maybe. Whoop. Okay, now here's the version that Bach uses for Canon 5. So uh, the most important difference here is that the king's theme starts and ends on the same note, but this adaptation of Bach ends one whole tone higher than it starts. And Bach is going to use this 
this uh, modified theme as the baseline for Canon 5. But every time it repeats, it's going to repeat starting one tone higher. So this sounds kind of impossible, but uh, this is what it's, this is how it's going to be. If you look at this this part of the score here, where uh, this is like just like the baseline. So here's the first iteration of the King's theme, but then you can see over here, the next iteration is starting one whole tone higher. And I'm going to use this uh, uh, graphical representation of the melodic line. Okay, so we can follow uh, what happens with the various iterations. Now let me go back to the, the overall structure of, uh, of Canon 5. So here's, here's one iteration of the Canon. So uh, <clears throat> on the top line, you'll see the royal theme, which we just heard exactly as we heard it in its first iteration. Now, along with that, you, you have two other voices, a first Canon voice and a second Canon voice. In this particular instance, the uh, the second voice copies the first exactly, but it's one fifth higher. So the first one starts on a uh, a C here, and the uh, the second one starts on the G one fifth higher. Okay, this is a a Canon so-called Canon at the fifth. But the particular wrinkle here is that on each repetition. Right. The first, remember the 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 bass line has modulated up one whole tone, and the two canonical voices also modulate up one whole tone. So the whole thing modulates up uh, one whole tone. So let me play this the whole canon for you. This is a recording by Michael Monroe, and we'll follow the uh, modulations of the royal theme. This is played for an, an ensemble of, of guitars. So you'll be hearing the royal theme and then on top of it, so to speak, right? These two canonical voices imitating each other one fifth apart and uh, cycling over and over again, uh, <clears throat> each time one whole tone higher. Uh, this thing uh, lasts about three minutes, but uh, bear with me.
So what's going on here? Is this going to keep going up forever? Well, actually, it's an illusion. So if you, uh, I have some equipment I use for recording bird songs, and I made a sonogram of, uh, of this recording. And uh, if you look at the sonogram, you can see that the, the seventh iteration is exactly the same pitch as the first. So even though we feel we were going up the whole time, we actually have uh, ended up exactly where we started. So this is a, a, an early example of something that's a phenomenon that's called uh, shepherd's tones. Uh, we perceive the pitch as rising, right? But uh, our ears are, along with being sensitive to pitch, are also, when we listen to music, sensitive to tonality. And uh, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're not just rising through pitches, we're, we're cycling through tonalities. So uh, this illusion is called a shepherd scale. Uh, Right, the, the last chord you heard is that is exactly the same as the first chord you heard, but uh, it felt like uh, we were going up the whole time. So this is an acoustic analog of Escher's impossible waterfall. <clears throat> It goes on forever. <laughs> it seems to be going up, but actually, it's it's just uh, it's just recycling among these tonalities. So, in tonality space, uh, pitches that are an octave apart are are equivalent, and we perceive them. We have trouble actually uh, telling if <clears throat> they sound to us essentially as a quote the same note, even though one has twice the frequency of the other right but this means that if we look at our our graph actually in tonality space uh it it collapses right we <clears throat> right it all collapses down to within one octave where the the bottom of the octave uh which you know <clears throat> whichever pitch you start with is identified with the uh, the pitch, which is uh, twice the frequency, actually, but the same tonality. So in tonality space, the picture collapses, and uh, uh, <clears throat> together with the horizontal translation symmetry uh, coming from the repeat, uh, we have actually a, a torus topology here. So if you look at the look at our our <clears throat> our color-coded version of the score after the compactification, right? These two edges, the top and the bottom, are identified because they have the same tonality, and uh, that creates a tube. And then if we identify the top of the tube with the end because of the repetition, uh, we get a torus. Uh, notice that uh, the uh, the geometric picture we're used to of a torus uh, has curvature, right? There's uh, <clears throat> there's regions of positive curvature around the outside, regions of negative curvature around the inside, uh, and this doesn't make sense for musical score because the two directions are kind of incompatible. One is time, and one is pitch. Uh, <clears throat> the score is a flat torus. It has no curvature, and it comes from identifying opposite edges of a rectangle. So the flat torus exists out there in platonic space. You can't smoothly exhibit it in three-dimensional space, but it's a, uh, for us mathematicians, it's a, just another uh, geometric object. So on this flat torus, the melodic line of the canon you just heard winds around uh, seven times in one direction, 
and and once than the other. Now there's a uh, a beautiful video that I'm going to show you that was posted on YouTube explaining how the crab canon can be written on a Mobius strip. So uh, there's something really wrong with this, and uh, I want you to watch carefully and see if you can figure out what's the problem, at least from my point of view. Uh, let me say a word about the crab canon. This is also this is part of the musical offering. It's also derived from the royal theme. Uh, but in this case, the two voices play the score starting from opposite ends. So uh, this is in Bach's uh, puzzle canon uh, mode here. Uh, at the beginning, you see an alto clef, a time signature, that's the C, and the, those three flats give you the key signature. And at the end, you see the same, the same, uh, the same signatures, but they're written backwards. And so that was Bach's uh, hint that uh, the the second voice was going to be playing the the same score, but starting at the back and playing toward the front. So here's the movie. Uh, let let me uh, let me play it for you. Well, that's beautiful, <clears throat> but the problem is that uh, the bringing the Mobius strip in is uh, <clears throat> is completely arbitrary. This procedure works 
with any one line text. Uh, <clears throat> if you uh, start with the text <clears throat> the way they did, uh, you cut the text in two at the top, start of the first line, end of the first line, start of the second line, end of the second, end of the next line, right? And then uh, you flip the second one and stick it onto the back of the first one, stick the two together and give them a twist and and you have a Mibia strip. But there was nothing uh, non-orientable about the uh, the procedure in the first place. Uh, the, the trouble is uh, that they're writing on both sides of the Mibia strip as if there were two different sides. But unless to be uh, to partake in the Mibia strip topology, the text has to be in the strip, not just printed on the face of the strip. Because uh, if you can print on the face of the strip, right, then you can imagine right here the the strip is is white, and you can imagine pulling the two surfaces of the strip apart, right? Uh, once you can pull the two surfaces of the strip apart, you don't have a Mibia strip anymore. You have really the cylinder, which is doubly covering uh, the Mibia strip. So you can write any text on the, on the two sides of a Mibia strip. So it's a lovely movie, but it uh, gives people maybe the wrong impression that there's some uh, non-orientable topology in the Crab Canon. The Crab Canon is a totally amazing piece of music, but it is not amazing in this particular way. Okay, that kind of wraps up uh, the uh, the presentation, but uh, I'd be very happy if you guys have any questions. We have a few minutes left uh, to uh, to talk more about this. I'm looking for I'm looking for questions in the f Facebook. Let's see if they have some the comments. I don't know. If, if anyone in the face would like to make a question, just write down a comment and we can see it. There's someone asking if you know why is it called the crab cannon? Because uh, there's a uh, an idea that crabs walk sideways, I think, you know, uh, and uh, somehow the motion, the fact that it could move back and forward at the same time, made people think of a crab. I think that's the re that's the reason. <laughs> right. Cause if you watch crabs move, right, they, they tend to uh, scuttle sideways. There is another question by Jonas Scover. Uh, is there examples of music where the topology is a climb bottle? <laughs> uh, not that I know of, no. I, I've thought of that, but uh, I don't think... Uh, um, I don't think, I mean, it would, uh, I, I, not as far as I know, right? Because the, 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 uh, that second connection, uh, which is, uh, in tonality space, uh, it's kind of complicated to figure out how that would, how you could work that musically into something, uh, topologically interesting with a twist. Uh, I don't know, uh, but I, I, I thought about it, but uh, I just don't know. Um, let me see, Dario, do you, do you see another question or uh, comment? Yes, there is another question that I was actually wanted to ask also myself um, about the fractality in Bach's music, like you, you mentioned some of the symmetries, but they are asking what about the fractality in Bach's music? I, 
I haven't encountered, I don't think, um, there's sort of, uh, the only thing like fractality, which is kind of partially uh, uh, um, evident is when he uh, writes, for example, a canon uh, in where, when a second voice comes in in augmentation, because then you have a, a scaling, right? You have uh, a voice, and then uh, it it appears again with all the notes doubled, right? So if you could sort of play that backwards and keep repeating it, you would have something like a fractal, but you never go past uh, you never go past. Uh, I'm not even sure if there's ever a piece where you have both diminution, which would be playing it twice as fast, and augmentation, playing it half as fast, together in the same piece. Then you have three three time scales together. Uh, I can imagine that. I'm not sure it actually ever happens, but that's the limit. If you wanted a fractal, you'd have to be able to do it uh, an arbitrary number of times. Right, so I I think maybe that's what people are thinking about when they say fractal, but I I don't know. Uh, it's a uh, it's tempting, but it's hard to see uh, how you can work uh, fractality usefully in in the time domain. Uh, you know, but you know, it would, the fractality would involve things going faster and faster and faster, right? Uh, but very rapidly, you would get a, a blur. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe yeah. just a couple of iterations. That again? Maybe just a couple of iterations. Of That's Alpha right, a couple of iterations. Well, you, you do have, if you want a couple of iterations, then you can get it in, uh, in uh, I think even in the musical offering, there may be a canon uh, with augmentation. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but there certainly are uh, augmentations in a lot of his fugues. Um, yeah, it's a. Uh, there is a feeling in 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 music of uh, sort of acceleration. You get that in, uh, for example, not so much in Bach, but in uh, in Mozart, for example, you will get a. Uh, a melodic line that uh, uh, <clears throat> it tends to uh, get faster at the end. I mean, it's just the way uh, I think the the way we came to perceive a musical phrase that we feel is coming to its end when it sort of accelerates. Uh, and there's, uh, but that isn't very fractal-like, is it? <laughs> yeah, that's. That's the most I know. There is another question by Stefano da Firenze. He wonders if it's possible to add an extra dimension using forte and piano, strong and lower volumes, etc. Yeah, once more, uh, add an extra dimension by doing what? Considering the volume, the, the, the dynamics of the music, uh, forte, piano, etc. Um, that's possible. I mean, that's certainly a dimension you can, you can play with whether or not, um, you can do it in such a way as to, uh, get useful contrast in the same piece. Uh, I don't know if that's, uh, if that's a possibility, right? Cause if you play something loud and something soft, the uh, the loud thing just kind of overwhelms the soft. Uh, uh, I don't know uh, exactly how that could work, but it's a. Uh, I mean, there are only so many dimensions uh, you can work with. Uh, the thing is, be able to get them together into a musical composition uh, in a. Uh, useful and artistically interesting way. Uh, good question, though. I don't know. And Anna Breu 
would like to know if you can make recommendation of books, articles, etc. You know, for people to read a little bit more about this. I actually, I don't think there's been very much written about it. I mean, I have. Uh, there's this article that Eric and I wrote in the in the Musical Times, but otherwise, uh, and if you want, there's a reference to it on. If you can get to my web page, there's uh, my bibliography is there, and it's uh, the the reference is there. But um, I don't think we had any references in that article to 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 other work. So uh, I don't think this has been explored very much. Uh, one place I would look is in uh, Hofstadter's work. You know, he wrote the guy who wrote Gödel Escher Bach, right? Uh, has everyone already forgotten about Gödel Escher Bach? It was really big 20 years ago. Uh, and maybe I pronounced his name wrong. Gödel Escher Bach, does this ring a bell? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Anyway, there's this, uh, this guy wrote this really fascinating book about uh, and it's about patterns. Uh, it's really about this uh, patterns in, in in music and in and in art and in and in mathematics. Right, Gödel, uh, the mathematician. Uh, so the the uh, maybe the main thing there is uh, this comes back to your question about fractality, is the uh, is the self-reference. Right when self-reference occurs in in music and uh, and in art and and in mathematics, uh, there. Uh, so he wrote a whole book about this. It's it's really fascinating, and uh, I'm disappointed that it seems to have gotten forgotten. <laughs> but it was it was very hot 20 years ago. Or maybe forty years ago. Who knows? I mean, at my, at my age, it's all the same, right? <laughs> I wonder. I mean, more contemporary music like Ligeti or Kurta, yeah. etc. Probably they have something similar. It can be possible to do something about it, right? Well, I mean, minimalist possible. music, minimal, minimal music, for instance, right? Steve, right? <laughs> Right. It's very possible that, uh, like Steve Reich, for example, you might be uh -huh. able to, uh, uh, if you wanted to study fractality, for example, that's one place I would look, uh -huh. right, and uh, and see how he, uh, how he handles concepts like that, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's, uh, yeah, those are good places to look. So your article is a musical time, right? In, in which year? That's right. That's right. Do you know the year where it appeared the article? I'm, More or less. I think twenty. Uh, it's it's in the recording because it's mentioned at the beginning of the of the talk, but it's something okay. like twenty fifteen, I okay. believe. Perfect. I don't think I don't see any more questions. Do you, Daria? There is one more, but here in the chat from Bruno. Ah, okay. I didn't see it. Bruno, uh, you can ask it. <laughs> I, well, I, you already answered it, but my question was if there are another examples of these structures in music we set back. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, Mainly in the like the Mobius strip in the in the partitures. I mean, this is not just the repeating patterns, but this twist that you have on the on the notes. I mean, I don't know if there are another examples that you know of. Uh, for a Mobius strip, it's. Uh... Uh, I'm pretty sure there are other examples in Bach, but I don't know outside of Bach if, I mean, he was like the most uh, kind of systematically, um, um, I would say, mathematically uh, organized of, of of all the composers, right? There, there's a uh, 
you know, if you listen to Bach, uh, actually, I was discussing this with Eric just this year. Um, he has a kind of a cerebral dimension that uh, uh, other composers just don't have. For example, if you compare uh, Bach with uh, Handel, who was an almost exact contemporary and a, uh, you know, a titanic uh, musician who wrote uh, really uh, very, very beautiful, very, very moving, uh, you know, wonderful works of art. But they're just, uh, they just don't have, you know, if you, you, you can always tell Handel from Bach uh, after three or four minutes because uh, Bach always is doing something with his head. There's always something going on that you just don't get with other composers. So uh, you probably can't expect uh, to see this uh, really uh, in other places. Uh, Maybe uh, in the 20th century, so first of all, this kind of intellectual music fell out of fashion. Uh, in fact, toward the end of Bach's life, already people thought his music was uh, very old fashioned and uninteresting. And they wanted things more in the, the Gallant style uh, with, uh, with Mozart uh, and then moving on into Romanticism. They never really came back to uh, this uh, obsession with uh, with structure that that Bach had, and uh, uh, I mean they 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 recognize it. Like Beethoven uh, experiments a lot with uh, with fugue, uh, which is uh, like uh, it's kind of a a musical form based on canons, but not strict canons, but with, uh, but with a lot of uh, imitation. And uh, uh, in, in Beethoven's, uh, let's see, I think his 16th uh, string quartet has a, called the Grosse Fuga, a big, uh, the Great Fugue, uh, which has all kinds of uh, counterpoint that he learned from Bach probably, or from Bach's contemporaries that were still of musical interest to him. Uh, but it's, it's, it's quite unusual to have, uh, um, yeah, and in Beethoven, uh, Haydn and Mozart also will have, uh, episodes where you you have imitation of voices but it's it's unusual and they never insist on it because it was considered boring in in uh in those times to be this music sounded pedantic to them and they didn't uh they didn't go for it i think maybe at the beginning of the the 20th century you would look with people like webern uh, they got back into a more uh maybe structural intellectual analysis of music and uh, possibilities there, but I'm not very familiar with, with, with that. I can't remember what was the exact, what was the exact question? <laughs> <laughs> I think you answered the question, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we are going to say goodbye to the people in Facebook and we can stay a little bit longer if you like. Uh, sure. But just say goodbye to people in Facebook. Bruno, thank you. Adios.